So good morning everyone and welcome to the first stage of our tour today. A lovely crisp morning here just outside Ahar in the Glen of Alta Davin, a place very close to my heart. I live just about a quarter of a mile away from this location. So again, welcome to this secluded glen, just three miles outside of Ahar. And about a quarter of a mile up the road, we enter into County Monaghan. So Alta Davin translates from the old Irish word Alta Jowan, which means the Druid's Glen or the Devil's Glen. And reasons for that will become more apparent as we embark on our tour. Just before we begin, make sure you're wrapped up well. It's quite a crisp morning here. Um, there are some overhanging branches, of course, um, some streams and lakes. There will be some steep gradients as we proceed through the trail. And also just be careful of the floor. There are plenty of leaves that have fallen, so it can be slippy in places. There are a number of steps as we come to the incline, so just to point those out before we begin. So I hope everyone's ready. Very excited. As I said, this is a place very close to my heart. Just as we approach the climb to the Chur and Well, some locals have named this part of the path Ahar's Own Dark Hedges. So just to point out here also that there are two options for yourselves. Those maybe with some limited mobility can go straight ahead and follow the path round. Those that are a little bit more daring can follow me and come down this narrow path. There are some quite steep steps here and I will show you as we get closer. So... It is quite narrow and it is a little bit slippy in places. Um, but yes, this is just at the very base. You can see just right in front of me there, the climb towards the chair and well itself. And it lo does look really beautiful this morning, actually. So behind me, you see the steps towards the summit of the Churned Well. This glen is believed to have been formed during the last ice age. Um, the incline is about 100 feet to the very top where the chair is situated. So be prepared for some aerobic exercise this morning. Again, take care as we make our way towards the top. Please use the handrails provided and again watch for leaf litter and there are some as you can see we are quite high up now local people would also refer to that lane below us as the middle line so it is another way of approaching the churn well but we're going to go the traditional way the way of St Patrick I often wonder how Patrick must have discovered areas such as these. Ireland back in the 5th century was decentralised, heavily forested, with no towns and cities. So we get a sense here of Ireland of old and Patrick converting these heathens, as he referred to them. So, just to the right here of the chair, as we face forward, there are a series of stones that are believed to have been pagan altars. Sacrifices would have been made here, human and animal, to the various pagan gods, of which we believe there were 400 back in the, in the 5th and 6th century. It would make sense, therefore, that Patrick would come here 
bringing a policy of enculturation, the marriage of Christianity and paganism. This was a favor. So an example of this policy of enculturation was that Patrick would have replaced the sacrifices of the ancient roots and lands to the gods with the sacrifice of the Eucharist or mass itself. Many believe that this series of rocks were used as an altar mass rock during penal days. It is said that the priest, with the price on his head, followed them up to the mountain and in the early morning offered up holy mass. There was nothing other than the mist upon the hills no music but the wind among the bracken and no lights save the stars that shone down upon a stricken land. So behind these stones it is believed that there may have been burial chambers. And so here we have the chair itself. It's about eight feet high and five feet wide. Tradition has it that if anyone makes a wish while sitting on the chair, it will come true, if not disclosed to anyone else. So here we go. So tradition tells us that St. Patrick sanctified this chair by sitting on it and saying mass and consequently converting many of the local people. So pilgrims that come here will always sit on the chair and make a wish. So please don't share your wishes with anyone else, but let us know at some point if they do come true. If you feel like you want to come to the chair and sit on it, please again, be careful as, as it is quite slippy. Good luck. So the well itself is about one foot wide and seven inches deep and it's supposed to hold a cure for all sorts of diseases but in particular warts and so here is the well itself. St Patrick is said to have blessed the well bestowing cures on its water. Tradition tells us that this well never runs dry even on the warmest sunny day. Though I think you'll agree in Ireland, those kind of days are few and far between. So, this is not the typical kind of tree one would find in a in a walk through a forest. Um, this is known as the rag tree. And pilgrims come here seeking a cure for whatever disease they have. And they will leave behind a token or a piece of clothing in thanksgiving for receiving the cure for whatever they've come to pray for. So there, are, it's an interesting array of belongings and materials behind me. But I suppose it shows us just how popular this little site is for visitors every year. Now again, as we make our way back up to the path, the main path, can I just ask you to be mindful of the steep steps, the narrow steps, and the fact that it might be slippy in places. Thank you.
And again, I'm often reminded of Patrick as he referred to himself as the stranger or the foreigner in his confessio coming to places such as these with only one vision in mind to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. The Romans referred to Ireland as Hibernia the land of winter a very true statement but just how beautiful does this glen look today so the descent is quite steep just take your time there are no hand railings for a few meters so just nice and steady and just enjoy this beautiful view Just before we begin our second stage of the tour, uh, just a little anecdotal story. Um, beside us here, there is a field known locally as the Heather Field. And traditionally, for many years of my childhood, and indeed years before that, local people would come and gather here on a Sunday in August known as Heather Sunday. And it seems that that was an old tradition um, dating back maybe a few hundred years, possibly from penal times, uh, when people would gather to celebrate harvest and there would be games and activities. But it was a real sense of community, lovely community spirit. Unfortunately, like many old traditions, it has dissipated. But back in the day, it really was a fantastic opportunity for people to come together. So, our next part of the journey takes us to the River Blackwater, located here on the Ahar Atnatloy Road, or Favour Oil Road as it's known locally. It is here that the great St Patrick, who was unfortunately in his later years, was said to have been carried across rivers and lakes such as these by his disciple St McCartan. McCartan translates a strong man and indeed master and disciple became very very close around these areas. It is said also that St McCartan fell in love with this area and asked the master if he could build a monastery here. Patrick, empathetic to McCartan's requests, granted him the sight just five miles away at Clogher Cathedral. Another interesting piece of tradition found in the annals of Ulster tells us that McCartan was known locally as the staff of St. Patrick. And I suppose this affirmation or confirmation of McCartan's request, St. Patrick is said to have granted McCartan his own staff. And so it was brought to Clogher as testament to Patrick's support of all of the work that St. McCartan had done in this local valley. And so we find ourselves here, the Millennium Forest Walk, or Derry Gorry as it's known to the locals. Just behind me here, we're going to approach Favour Royal Estate, where the young John Hughes, who called by his father to work the land, displayed an aversion to toiling, and so was employed in Favour Royal Estate 
to work with the gardener there, Roger Toland. Hughes expressed an interest in horticulture and spent years here at Favour Royal Forest Estate before he emigrated to America in 1917. Of course, we know John Hughes went to become the Archbishop of New York. And our last stage of the journey will bring us to the fourth chapel, just a few miles away. So, as we approach towards Favour Royal Estate, please just be careful of your footing on the ground. <laughs>